Just gonna give a second to clear the waiting room. As a reminder, when you are joining, please mute yourself unless you are appearing or testifying before the board. Good morning, this is a hearing before the licensing board for the city of Boston. Today is Tuesday, January 18th, 2022. Today's hearing is being held pursuant to temporary amendments to the open meeting law. That is what allows us to meet virtually. Today's hearing will be recorded and posted to the city of Boston website. Before I review procedural matters, I will introduce Chairwoman Kathleen Joyce. Good morning, my name is Kathleen Joyce. I'm chair of the licensing board and I'm joined today by Commissioner Kiana Saxon and Commissioner Liam Curran. Thank you. Please ensure that your audio and visuals are working properly. I will call each item in the order it appears on the agenda. I will then ask who is present on behalf of the licensee and who is on behalf of the Boston Police Department and whether there are any other individuals with knowledge of the alleged incident. I will then swear in all parties. After that, the police report will be read into the record and the licensee or the representative will have the opportunity to make a brief statement followed by questions by the chairwoman and the commissioners. Again, all testimony will be limited only to individuals with personal knowledge of the alleged incident. Now calling item number one, 955 LLC, doing business as Dillon's located at 951 Boylston Street. Uh, date of the incident, October 31st, 2021. Patron on patron assault in violation of Mass General Law, chapter 138, section 64, and chapter 265, section 13A and expired assembly permit in violation of Mass General Laws, Chapter 138, Section 64, and Board's Rule 1.02b. Who is present on behalf of the licensee? Sorry, is there anyone here present on behalf of Dillon's? Okay. We will come back for a second call. Now calling item number two, Game On Fenway LLC, doing business as Game On Sports Cafe, located at 72 to 82 Lansdowne Street. Date of the incident, October 24th, 2021. Patreon, patron assault and violation of Mass General Laws, chapter 138, section 64, and chapter 264, section 13A. And patron on employee assault in violation of Mass General Laws, chapter 138, section 64, and chapter 265, section 13A. Who is present on behalf of the licensee? Good morning, Mr. Green, Madam Chair, members of the board, Dennis Quilty, attorney representing the licensee. With me this morning, uh, Anthony Chuga and uh, Joe Hicks, uh, both uh, management personnel for the licensee. Good morning. Good morning, thank you. And who is present on behalf of the Boston Police Department? Detective Sean Wallace, District 4. Great. Thank you, Detective Wallace. And are there any other individuals with personal knowledge of the alleged incident who wish to testify on this matter? Okay, uh, can you all please raise your right hand? Thank you. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? Yes, sir. I do. Great, thank you, Det uh, Detective Wallace. Uh, please proceed with the police report. Okay, <clears throat> about 1.35 a.m. on Sunday, October 24th, 2021, Officer La Rosa and Officer Keenan assigned to the Delta 105 Alpha responded to a radio call for report of an assault and battery in progress at 82 Lansdowne Street, Boston, game on. Officers were assisted by Sergeant Aziz, the Delta 910, Officer Grakowski and Officer Merriam in the Delta 101 Alpha and Officer Joseph in the Delta 205 Alpha. Officers were advised that individual on scene was struck with the bottle and that the suspect was still in the area. The following suspect description as provided, Hispanic male, 35 years old, five foot eight in height, wearing a tan colored sweater and blue colored jeans. On arrival, officers observed a large group of people outside of game on. As staff from the bar indicated that assistance was needed, officers observed a physical altercation involving the bouncers from game on and victim number one, later identified as Gary Wilgus. Officers observed the witness, later identified as Sean McKenna, attempting to separate victim one Wilgus from the altercation with the bouncers. As officers approached, victim number two, Miriam Raffeld, also was observed attempting to separate victim number one Wilgus from the bouncers. Officers observed as victim number two, Raffeld, was struck in the face by victim number one's 
uh, Wegas's elbow. Victim number two, Rathfeld, immediately started bleeding from the nose as a result of the accidental contact. Once the individuals were separated, Officer Keegan spoke to victim number one, Wilgus, and Officer LaRosa spoke with victim number two, Rathfeld. Victim number one, Wilgus, stated that he was utilizing the restroom inside of Game On when he was struck in the side of the head with a glass bottle. Victim number one, Wilga, stated that he did not know the suspect. Officers observed swelling in the area where victim number one, Wilga, stated he was struck. Officers requested the assistance of Boston EMS. Ambulance 3 Alpha 16, Joyce and Snyder, arrived on scene. Boston EMS Ambulance 3A16, Joyce and Snyder, offered medical attention to both victim number one, Wilga, and victim number two, Raffeld as both individuals denied needing medical attention. The witness McKenna provided a photo of the suspect to officers. Officers searched the area and were unable to locate anyone matching the suspect's description. Sergeant Aziz, the Delta 910, was notified of the above mentioned incident and responded on scene to conduct a code 35 license premise investigation. License premise violation citation 044642 was issued as a result of a patron on patron assault in addition to patron on employee assault. Officers were, were equipped with Boston police issued axon body worn cameras during the incident. That is the conclusion of the Boston police report. Great, thank you. Uh, Attorney Quilty, would you like to address the alleged incident? Yes, if I may. Um, is it uh, Detective Wallace? Yes, sir. It, and were you present on the night of the incident? I was not, sir. Okay, so you're reading from a report authored that correct. night by the officers on scene. That's thank correct, you. sir. And with regard to the inspection notice, it indicates that management was cooperative with the police. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct, sir. Thank you. And um, just reading the details of the uh, narrative, um, the narrative indicates that staff from the bar indicated that assistance was needed. We believe that to be our witness here this morning, Anthony Trula. Do you, are you familiar with whoever it is that, that Ask for police assistance. I am not. Oh, uh, actually, oh I'm sorry. No, I, I'm not, but I'm, I'm very familiar with Anthony. I've, I've worked with Anthony in the past. Absolutely. Okay. All right. And uh, do you know, again, I, I know you weren't there that night, but subsequently um, I'm informed that uh, the cooperation included uh, Mr. Chu oh. Anthony providing video to the BPD of the incident. Is that correct? That is correct, sir. Yes. All right. Um, Thank you. Thank you, Sergeant Detective Brother. I know you have no personal knowledge, but appreciate your uh, testimony. Thank you very much. Um, Absolutely, sir. Thank you. May I, uh, Mr. Green? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Thank you. So we have uh, Mr. Chuga, who's Anthony, that uh, you've just heard of, is here. Uh, he's the one who was outside, who, uh, you know, asked for the police assistance. Uh, the occurrence, as you'll hear, this incident between two people apparently happened in the bathroom and nobody on the premise was aware of it until these two individuals saw each other out in the street. At closing time, you heard the number of people in the street, the doors had already been closed, even though it was not yet 2 a.m., they had closed early. Uh, there were people gathered outside waiting for rides and the lake. Uh, and apparently these two individuals who got into a scuffle in the bathroom saw each other and went at it again. Um, that's really all that we know Mr. Chuga did supply the uh, BPD with the video of the entire incident. Um, we think the, the staff did everything they could in the circumstances to keep people from uh, becoming involved in this uh, fight. And again, this individual, whoever it is that was identified was unable to be found uh, in the area and the staff had no, no knowledge again as, as to what happened inside the bathroom. Um, Mr. Chuga, you've been sworn. Would you just state your name for the record? Anthony Chuga. And were you present on the night in question? Yes, I was. And were you indeed the employee who asked for the police assistance outside? Yes, I was. And are you the employee who provided all of the video to the BPD subsequently? Correct. Yes, I was. Um, and with regard uh, to the uh, incident itself, this was uh, at closing time, is that correct? Correct. Okay. And what were you what were you and staff doing at this time as the doors were closed outside? Um, I was outside. One of my one of my employees had been struck, um, 
And I advised both of them to get inside. And I was outside trying to just de-escalate the situation. Um, it didn't take long for the police to show up. As soon as they did, I kind of stepped to the side and asked them, and I told them that we have a situation going on and that I could use their help. And immediately they stepped in. And when they stepped in, uh, I don't know the guy's name, but the tallest one there, he he was the one with the problem. And he started, he was even screaming with the officers, pushing them back. Um, and this was this was after I had, like this person was all they were, everyone was out the building the doors were locked, um, and like you said we were closing. Okay, so at that point did you do you and the staff stood by and just uh, let the let the BPD handle the situation? Yeah, I had already put in I had already pulled in after my employee was struck. I told him to go back inside that I'd handle the front door for any uh, further issues, and it was just me outside. Okay. With the police. And, and and do you have any idea who it is that that struck somebody inside the establishment? I didn't know that anyone was struck inside the building. We just kicked someone out for there was a there was a small altercation, screaming, shouting from the bathroom. Um, we kicked one person out through the front and one through out the out through the back. And the one guy from the back side actually made it. <coughs> when they reencountered each other is when they started to go out it again. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, the board members may have some questions for you. Absolutely. Thank you. Chairman Joyce. I just want to ask um, who uh, Mc Sean McKenna is in the police report. Is that a patron or a staff member? Uh, Sean McKenna isn't one of our staff. He is not? Okay. Um, I don't have any questions um, for, for, the, um, for any of them today. I don't either, thank you. Nothing additional, thanks. Okay. Thank you, the board will take this matter under advisement. Thank you. <coughs> thank you. Now calling item number three, Congress Fine Dining LLC, doing business as Lucky's, located at 355 to 359 Congress Street, date of the incident, October 23rd, 2021, employee on patron aggravated assault in violation of Mass General Law, Chapter 138, Section 64, and Chapter 265, Section 13A. Who is present on behalf of the licensee? Uh, Mr. Gray, members, again, Dennis Fulte, attorney representing the licensee with me this morning is uh, Nelson Burns, who is the GM, and uh, Jamal Schaffner, who was one of the security staff on duty on the night in question. Thank you. Thank you. And who is present on behalf of the Boston Police Department? Uh, Officer Burke should be present. I saw his name on there and Detective uh, Swain. Okay, let me just see if they're present. I see Terrence Burke. Is that the same? Yeah, I see him on here. Yes. Uh, Officer Burke, are you present? Are you able to put on your camera or microphone? Yes, sir. Can you not see me and all hear me? Yep, I can. We can see you and hear you now. Thank you. Uh, okay. Are there any other individuals with uh, not personal knowledge of the incident who would like to testify as well? Uh, Detective Swain, Boston Police. Great. Thank you. Can you all please raise your right hand? Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Do. Yes. Okay, thank you. Then Officer Burke, is it? Please proceed with the police report. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Detective Terrence Burke. I'm with the Boston Police Department, currently assigned to Area C, District 11, which is uh, in Dorchester, on Saturday, October 23rd, 2021. Uh, I was doing a patrol shift in South Boston at about 10, 10 27 hours. I was dispatched to the Massachusetts General Hospital uh, in regards to a, um, a victim that had suffered injuries from the uh, early morning of the same day, October 23rd. Um, initially, when I arrived, I met with the Mass General Hospital Police who escorted me uh, to the through the emergency department, uh, where eventually I met up with the victim, uh, Mr. Um, Jack Caban, or Cabin, and Mr. Uh, Giovanni Abril. Mr. Giovanni Abril was the reporting party, and the victim was Mr. Jack Caban. Um, Due to the na nature of uh, Mr. Caban's injuries, uh, his jaw was wired, very complicated. He had other, other medical therapy going on. 
and to the fact that we were in a hallway um, and I had asked to have that moved, but it was declined. Um, I decided to speak with Mr. Giovanni Abril, his cousin, the reporting party, initially to establish a timeline of what had happened and what transpired. Um, Mr. Abril explained that he had, cousin, had been patronizing some of the local businesses in the uh, seaport area. They were from out of town. <laughs> and that um, eventually around midnight, they proceeded to uh, Lucky's Lounge at 355 Congress Street in South Boston. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Giovanni Abril had departed to go collect their vehicle. Um, leaving Mr. Uh, Mr. Jack Caban, the victim, there. And when he returned, he uh, discovered a group was act, uh, acting violent, tumultuous, and afraid, uh, with Mr. Jack Caban being the victim in the matter. Uh, eventually, I spoke with Mr. Jack Caban, who corroborated uh, all, all the timeline of the events, and that uh, he had explained that his cousin had left to go collect the vehicle. He, was, uh, he had lit up a cigarette as he was exiting uh, prior to exit and luckies when uh, words were exchanged with the security staff, or as he noted, the uh, bouncers, um, <clears throat> words were exchanged. Um, and uh, the specific gentleman, an African-American male, about 5'9", muscular build, became physically aggressive. Um, and then uh, other security staff um, joined in in the fray. Uh, this was witnessed as Mr. Uh, Jack Caban was coming back. I'm sorry, Mr. Giovanni was coming back. Um, and that's essentially what he gave me as a statement um, through the medical therapy and corroborated by his cousin, the reporting party. Great, thank you. Attorney Quilty, would you like to address the violation? Yeah. Yes, if I may. Um, detect is a detective? Or yes, I was serving in a patrol function that day, sir. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, you're from from the report. It would it would appear that you you responded to the hospital, so this was after the incident had occurred, and you have no personal knowledge of the incident itself. I do not, sir. All right, and <clears throat> I know the, the the other officer Swain is here, or Detective Swain, and that is the violation notice or the inspection notice was delivered the later, I guess, the same day. Is that yes. correct? Okay. Yes, that's correct. And at that time, you indicate that the establishment, the licensee, cooperated with you. Is that correct? Yes. Um, the um, so detective, I'm sorry, Detective Burke. The um, statement that you <clears throat> received was from Mr. Uh, Abril and Mr. Caban, correct? And you had no, yes. no, no statement or explanation from the establishment or the staff or anybody like that. No, sir. My function that day was just to take the initial report, and mm -hmm. then any follow-on investigation would be from the um, the respective districts uh, uh, detectives. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, and uh, Detective Swain, if I may, did the cooperation with you, to your knowledge, did the cooperation include uh, Mr. Nelson Burns, who's with us this morning, providing video of any uh, any video they had of that night to the police? Yes. And was Mr. Burns the person who you interfaced with? Yes. And was he cooperative to you personally? Yes. Did he um, explain to you what had occurred that night? Yes. Did he suggest to you or explain to you that Mr. Caban was the aggressor here? Yes. Did he explain to you that Mr. Cabron had uh, called the door staff, uh, for lack of a better description, the N-word? Yes. And did he tell you that they then spit in this gentleman's face? Yes. Is it? Did he then tell you that the spitting in the face and the calling of the N-word caused the, uh, the person to uh, basically defend himself? Yes. And uh, did you, were you given the name <clears throat> of that individual? I was. And was, is that, um, I don't even have, it's Elijah, I don't have his last name. Is that the Franklin. person? Franklin, yes. yes. So he's the person who was called the N-word and spat upon, and he's the person who then defended himself with Mr. Caban. Yes. Okay. Um, thank you, uh, Detective. Um, I don't have any further questions, but I would like to have Mr. Burns um, and witness uh, Jamal Schaffner speak. They've both been sworn. May I, Madam Chair? 
Yes. Thank you. Um, Mr. Uh, Mr. Burns, first of all, you've been sworn. What's your um, responsibility at the establishment? I'm the general manager of the restaurant. And were you actually on duty the night this incident is, is alleged to have occurred? I was on duty, but I was inside dealing with the inside nightly stuff at the end of the night, like getting, uh, getting ready to close the restaurant. Um, so I did not witness the incident. But you were there? I was there. And did you discover subsequently what had happened by talking to your staff? Uh, the next day I discovered what happened when, when <clears throat> the police came into the restaurant and I uh, said there was an assault that occurred and uh, I immediately took them up to the office to watch the cameras because I wanted to get to the bottom of whatever did happen. Okay. And you, you heard the <clears throat> questions and answers that I just went through with Detective Swain. Uh, is it your testimony that one of your then employees was was basically attacked outside the establishment? Yes, the gentleman I was told had lit, lit up the cigarette inside the vestibule and they asked him not to smoke inside there multiple times. And then he came back with some slurs and some not so nice words. And then there was an exchange at the top of the stairs. And then off to the side, there was his face was spat in and he was called the N word as his face was spat in and it. He spit right into his mouth, like right into his face. And as a result of that, did the employee defend himself? He did. Then a one-on-one -on -one fight broke out between him and the gentleman. Okay. And <clears throat> Mr. Franklin, is he uh, any longer employed by the establishment? He is not. And in fact, on the night in question, it's just a minor uh, matter, but he had not clocked in. He was there speaking to his friends. Is that correct? Yes, he works at another restaurant down the street, and he usually shows up when he gets cut. And if they need help at the end of the night, he'll he works full time, some full shifts, or he did work full shifts sometimes. But he would come after his shift and ask them if they were okay, if they needed help, and he'd either clock in for the last two hours of the night, or he would go home. And at this point, they said it wasn't very busy inside, and they said we're not going to need you. So he was just talking with the other door staff, the front door. But he was not clocked in. Okay. And um, you, you then later, later that day, or I guess the same day, but in the morning, you, you were then notified of the incident, and, and that's when you interfaced with Detective Swain. Uh, they came in the afternoon, I believe, okay. early. All right. And then, and you, you provide, you showed them the film, provided the film, et cetera. Yeah, there was two separate uh, camera systems, and then we had. Within a short period of time, I had our IT guy come in and download uh, all the footage onto a zip drive for them from both systems, and I called them back and delivered that to them. Okay, thank I you. Took thank the you. And showed Go ahead, them. I'm sorry. I took them in the office immediately. We we went, we went through all the cameras immediately. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, you welcome. Board may have some questions, Madam Chair. Whether you want me to go through the other witness first, and then, or, or whatever you choose. You can go to the other witness. Okay, thank you, sir. Is that uh, uh, Jamal Schaffner? Are you present with us today? Yes, good morning. Thank All right, thank you very much. Just having been sworn in, just identify yourself, please, uh, Mr. Schaffner. I'm Jamal Schaffner, security staff at Lucky's. Okay, and were you working the night of this incident? Yes, I was working the door. Okay, and at some point at that evening, were you talking with uh, Elijah Franklin and other other uh, personnel in the uh, vestibule entryway? Yeah, it was towards the end of the night. Um, we were about to close and he was just hanging out by the door, you know, chatting up with us. All right, and then did you observe the person now identified as Mr. Caban interact with uh, Mr. Franklin? Yeah, I, I, I identified the, the patron uh, coming out of the the restaurant, and he appeared to be very inebriated, and he's stumbling up the steps, you know, with a cigarette in his mouth, and we asked him not to light up the cigarette in the vestibule, and he, instead of engaging me, he engaged Elijah, and he asked him who he was, you know, and they immediately started swearing, and from there, um, he called him the N-word several times, and that is what um, started the escalation. Then they spilled out onto the sidewalk, you know, and uh, 
we witnessed uh, also the the friend he uh, the patron had a friend that was trying to come up behind Elijah, and um, and so the security staff stepped out onto the sidewalk to prevent anything, uh, you know, any further like uh, escalation of the the violence because at that point they were just uh, shoving each other and then. Uh, patron spit on Elijah at the column then were several times and that's when you know it's a one-on-one -on -one fight and you know the security staff did their best to break up any other individuals trying to get involved and um, yeah that was it okay. thank you sir and you you observed obviously what you just testified to yes I was there like right in front in, in your opinion, was Mr. Franklin defending himself? Oh, absolutely. I, I don't know any human being that would not defend themselves under those circumstances. Like, he's a pretty evenly tempered person, but after somebody's calling you the N-word several times and then spit in your face, you know, at that point, you know, as, like I said, it, I don't know anybody that wouldn't defend themselves under those circumstances. Thank you, Mr. Schaffner. The board members, the chairperson, the board members may have some questions for you. Sure. Thank you, Attorney Quilty. I don't have any questions. I don't either. Thank you. Nothing additional. Thank you. Thank you. With no questions from the board, the board will take this matter under advisement. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now calling item number four on today's agenda, Johnny's on the Side LLC doing business as West End Johnny's located at 138 Portland Street. Date of the incident, August 28th, 2021. Overserved patron in violation of Mass General Laws, Chapter 138, Section 64. Who is present on behalf of the licensee? Good morning, um, members of the board. Attorney Seamus O'Kelly on behalf of the licensee. And I have present with me uh, three witnesses who should be present, uh, Dana Roy, Arthur Medeiros, and John Karen, the licensee. Great, if all three of them could just have their cameras on and raise their hand, I saw one. One, two, okay, great, thank you. And who is present on behalf of the Boston Police Department? Uh, Lieutenant Detective Troy, this matter was spread into the record uh, um, uh, two weeks ago on January 4th, um, but I'll read the report again if necessary. Yep, that would be great. Thank you. The matter was continued. Are there any additional individuals with firsthand knowledge of the incident who wish to testify? Okay, could uh, everyone please raise your right hand? Thank you. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Great, thank you. Uh, John Detective Troy, you may proceed with the police report, please. If you could just give me one moment to locate the report. Sorry. Absolutely. Sorry. Uh, this is a, uh, an incident report authored by uh, Officer Gady from um, District 1, and it reads as follows. At about 12.09 a.m. on Friday, August 28, 2021, Officer Gate and Officer Hassan uh, received a radio call for a verbal confrontation at 138 Portland Street in front of the bar West End Johnny's. On arrival, officers were informed by security staff working there that one of their patrons was unable to stand up and was, uh, or walk due to being heavily intoxicated. Officers walked over to the victim, Mr. Carew, laying on the ground. Mr. Carew was incoherent and could barely speak or keep his eyes open. He fell forward on several occasions, attempting to stand up. While attempt attempting to uh, assist Mr. Carew, he began swearing at the officers and became physically aggressive. Mr. Carew was placed in handcuffs for officer safety, and uh, Boston EMS were, and, and a patrol supervisor were, uh, were summoned. So, uh, Sergeant Downey arrived on scene and issued a license premise citation to, um, to West End Johnny's uh, and uh, the victim, uh, Mr. Crew was transported by an ambulance to, uh, 
to Mass General Hospital. Um, let's see, 10 to the one one and, um, and then the second one ordered by uh, Sergeant Paul Downey uh, relative to the uh, license premise inspection. On Saturday morning, August 28th, Sergeant Downey conducted a license premise inspection of West End Johnny's 138 Portland Street as a result of a radio call for a disturbance outside the front entrance. District one officers found staff members from the bar club interacting with a highly intoxicated male who was served alcoholic beverages as a patron inside the establishment. The highly intoxicated patron was uncooperative and aggressive with staff and other patrons. Boston EMS was dispatched and transported the highly intoxicated patron to Mass General Hospital for evaluation. Mr. Arthur Majerus, manager, was cooperative throughout the inspection and held, had all the required license permits prominently displayed on the wall near the bar. License inspection notice number 60604 was issued to the establishment for uh, establishment serving patron excessively excessive alcoholic beverages. And that's the extent of the uh, incident reports. Thank you. And just to have on the record, this matter was continued from the January 4th hearing because the license violation was received by a staff member of the licensee um, and was not communicated to management or counsel. Attorney O'Kelly, would you like to address the alleged incident, please? Thank you, counsel. Um, Lieutenant Detective Troy, um, you, you were not present that, that early morning on the, the day no. of this incident, correct? No, it was not. And uh, you, you, in fact, have read from the reports of uh, Sergeant Downey, I believe, and also Officer Christina Gate. Is that correct? That's correct. Um, are you aware of this individual, Mr. Carew? Do you have any knowledge if he was, in fact, placed under arrest at the scene? Uh, from reading from the police report, he was not placed under arrest. He was transported by Boston EMS to uh, Mass General Hospital for treatment. Okay. And you, you would agree with me from reading the reports that the, uh, the manager, Mr. Arthur Medeiros, was fully cooperative with the Boston Police Department that evening? With From all indications in, in Sergeant Downey's report, he was very cooperative. Thank you. I have no further questions. Thank you. Chairman Joyce. Attorney O'Kelly, would you like to present your side? Yes, I would. Uh, I would like to call uh, Dana Roy, please. Hi, how are you doing? Uh, good morning, Mr. Roy. You've already been sworn, correct? That is correct. I just lost his image on the screen for some reason, but. I can see him, I'm but I, I'm he's, still under, here, yeah. he's under a different name. Uh, yeah. Kelly, <clears throat> under Caitlin. Okay. Yeah, that's my girlfriend, girlfriend's computer, sorry. All right. Um, you've already been sworn, Mr. Roy, correct? Y correct, yes. Could you please identify yourself to members of the board, please? I'm Dana Roy, I'm the general manager of West End Johnny's. Okay, and um, you've heard the recitation by uh, Lieutenant Detective Troy of the events of August the 28th, 2021. Yes, correct. Okay. correct. Were you present um, in West End Johnny's on August the 28th, 2021? I was. And, 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 and you are the, the the general manager of West End Johnny's, correct? Correct. And and that was that was your position on, on that on that date, August the 28, 2021, correct? Correct. Okay. Could you please tell me your your recollection of the events of that early morning? Yes. So either I forget who it was, either author or I called 911 about the uh, fights or disturbance that was happening in the street. Um, while that was happening, I observed uh, the overserved patron come outside. Um, I could see that he could, he was stumbling a little bit, and then I so I went over and tried to engage him, make sure he was okay. Uh, while I was talking to him, I had him sit down uh, on the windowsill, and while I was talking to him, he was he was speaking to me in, in what I would describe tongues. He was telling me that the devil was coming to get me, and that the world is coming to an end. Um, you know, it was just really bizarre things. So I was like this, you know, my opinion, this isn't alcohol. I, I thought he was on some sort of drug. 
at that time I waved over the female officer and I was like, this, this man needs help. There's, there's something wrong with him. Uh, she agreed with me at that time. She said, oh, what did she kept on asking him? What did you take? What did you take? He was, you know, uncooperative, unresponsive. Uh, at that time, the male officer came in, started asking him for an ID, uh, asking him also what he took. Uh, and then he, that he swung and, and punched the officer at that time. I, I backed away. The ambulance came. Uh, he, I believe he kicked the uh, paramedic and then they put him on the gurney and strapped him down and, and, and took him away. Um, it was a very bizarre incident. Was it, was it your opinion that this individual, uh, according to the reports of Mr. Carew, was under the influence uh, of narcotics? I believe so, yes. Okay. And um, just to be clear, your interaction with um, this individual, Mr. Carew, occurred outside the licensed premises on the street, correct? Yes, correct. And M Mr. Carew was, was taken away in an ambulance to a local hospital, correct? Correct, yes. I have no further questions unless members of the board have questions of this witness. Um, I would like to see if, um, I'm sorry, I, is it Mr. Roy? Mr. Roy. Yes. Do yes. you know, do you, are you aware of how long this patron was um, inside your premise? I have not, I was outside when, uh, when he was, I was outside when I saw him come outside, so I, I, I wasn't sure. Do you know how many drinks he consumed or purchased that night at West End Johnny's? I do not know. Um, the license premise was written up for over service of a patron. Did you have an opportunity to review any credit card receipts to see if he had any credit cards that were used to purchase drinks that night? Uh, I didn't. I didn't uh, have a chance to do that. No. Okay. I don't have any questions. Um, any more questions for Mr. Roy? Mr. Roy, was any inquiry made of your servers of their recollection of serving this individual? Uh, yeah, I asked people about him, but nobody had any recollection of uh, one in particular person that was overserved. I remember him solely because of the interaction that I had with him. Do you still have the receipts? Yeah, I can. Yeah, they're all digital. I can look them up. Uh, but that's only if um, I can get the last four digits of his credit card. Attorney O'Kelly, did you have other witnesses? I have one further witness, uh, Arthur Medeiros. Oh. Great, would you like to proceed? Please, I, I, I don't see his image um, again on the screen. We can see him, his name comes up as iPhone. Yeah, I'm here. Good, good morning, um, Mr. Medeiros. Um, uh, you have been sworn. Previously, I have, yes, correct. And um, you heard the uh, um, the testimony of Lieutenant Detective Troy in this matter earlier. Is that correct? I did, yes. And he related. Um, uh, he, he 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 read two police reports regarding an incident that occurred on August the twenty eighth, twenty twenty one. Right. Do you, do you recollect that day and were you were you present on that day? Yeah, I was present. I do recollect the, uh, recall the incident rather. Um, there was some sort of disturbance outside in the street on a sidewalk across from, from the premise from West End Johnny's. Uh, so I called 911. Uh, the officers arrived promptly and the incident was, was, was taken care of. And meanwhile, um, I walked over to the door and I saw Dana Roy talking to a gentleman who was sitting on the ground with his back against the uh, the wall, the building, and I asked Dana what was going on. And um, he told me that the gentleman had just come out and something was wrong with him. So we attempted to get some information out of the gentleman to find out what happened, what was wrong with him, if he had friends inside. And he was conscious, but he didn't really offer much information. He was somewhat 
uh, like Dana said, babbling and making no sense at all. So we called the officers over and said, you know, something's wrong with this gentleman. I think we need to call an ambulance. And um, from there on, it just, you know, he, he, he attacked the officer and it just sort of uh, went downhill from there. Did you witness the, did you witness what you described as an attack on the officer? I did not witness it, no. Okay. Um, so what's your position with um, West End Johnny's? Uh, the, because... nightlife, the nightlife uh, manager. And you were present on the premises that night, correct? I was, yeah. Okay. Do you recall seeing um, Mr. Carew, who was only identified as Carew in the report, do you recall mm -hmm. seeing this gentleman being served alcohol on the premises of West End Johnny's that night? I don't know. Um, and who called the police? Uh, I believe I called. Okay. And and are you the same Arthur Medeiros that the police officer described as being was uh, totally cooperative with the police department that evening? Correct. That would be me. Yes. You you showed the licenses and all other appropriate documentation. I did. Yeah. Correct. I did. Yes. Okay. I have no further questions. The board may have some questions of you, Mr. Medeiros. Okay. I don't have any questions at this time. Neither do I, thank you. You're welcome. Great, uh, Attorney O'Kelly, is that all? Th that is all. I have one other witness present, but um, I just, I, I have him present because he is the, the licensee, John Karen, uh, but I, I'm not intending to uh, to call Mr. Karen as a witness. We just, just have, have him present for the purpose of the hearing. Thank you, Attorney O'Kelly. Uh, if there are no further questions from the board, then the board will take this matter under advisement. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Now calling item number five, GSTH Investment Group, LLC, doing business as Bijou and Rock and Rye, located at 51 Stewart Street, date of the incident, November 5th, 2021. Persons under 21 in possession of alcohol on premise in violation of Mass General Laws, Chapter 138, Section 34A, 34C, and 64 to 64A. Who is present on behalf of the licensee? Good morning, uh, Mr. Secretary, uh, Madam Chair, members of the board, Stephen Miller, McDermott, Colty, and Miller. Also with me this morning, uh, Mete Aslan, who's the um, general manager and uh, Joe Ganem, who was uh, one of the managers uh, at the premises that evening. Thank you. And who is present on behalf of the Boston Police Department? Should be Detective I will be. Eddie Hernandez myself. I will be. Great. Thank you, Detective Hernandez. And mm -hmm. are there any other individuals mm -hmm. with firsthand knowledge of the alleged incident who wish to testify? Sergeant Detective Gallagher, if need be. Thank you. Can you all please raise your right hand? And that includes that. Thank you. Great. And uh, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. I do. Uh, thank you. Detective Hernandez, you may please read the police report. Good morning. I'll be reading uh, from a police report, which I wrote on Friday, uh, November 5, 2021. Signed Detective William Gallagher, Detective Eddie Hernandez, assigned to the BPD. License permission and conducted a license permission inspection of PG located at 5153 Stewart Street in Boston. While detectives were walking past the bar area, detectives observed three female patrons standing at the bar area with alcoholic drinks. Detectives noticed these females looked young. Detective asked them to produce identification to confirm their ages. Three female patrons said they were over 21 years of age and produced driver's license and initially appeared as though they were all over 21 years of age. Detectives used a license verification program, which confirmed that, that the driver's license were indeed fraudulent. The fraudulent driver's licenses were, contained the person's name, but displayed the date of birth made it appear so they were over 21 years of age. The fraudulent driver's licenses were confiscated by detectives. After a further investigation, detectives were able to confirm the underage identities of Alexis Weldner, Arula Saminis, and Brooke Thill. These patrons will be summoned to court for persons under 21 person of alcohol and possession of fraudulent identification. Detectives brought this to the attention of the person in charge, Mr. Joe Gaiman. As a result of what detectives have observed, Sergeant Detective Gallagher issued a license permit and inspection notice 060300. Persons under 21 person of alcohol on premise, Mr. Uh, 
Heyman signed for an accepted notice. Essentially. Thank you. Attorney Miller, would you like to address the alleged incident? Yes, please. Uh, detective, was uh, Mr. Ganim and the staff cooperative with you and, and Sergeant Gallagher? Yes, extremely, sir. And, and did um, these three female patrons confirm that they had shown um, the fraudulent IDs to enter the premises? Yes, sir. Um, and you observed, um, you've been to the premises numerous times, I'm sure, okay. detective. What time, and, sir? Yeah, and, and you observed uh, the um, system that they have at the front door for yes, um, checking and scanning IDs. Uh, well, they didn't, they, they, I, th I believe they have one now. I'm not sure if they had one that night. Okay. Um, I, I have no further questions. Uh, I have, I have a, a video, which I apologize, I, I didn't get um, to the board before the hearing, but I can have it delivered over this morning, um, showing the, um, not only these three girls on the exterior of the premise that uh, with having their IDs um, scanned uh, by, the, uh, by the staff, but also um, the video goes a little bit longer and it shows uh, other members of the public trying to get in and uh, being turned away. But it, it clearly, it, it also shows the uh, three women uh, in the in the premises too. Um, so uh, I'd like to be able to have that delivered over to you this morning, Madam Chair. Sure, please, you can do that. Okay, um, so um, Mr. Aslan, you there? I saw him, I saw him on earlier. Uh, we have like a very bad connection. Okay, oh, there you are. Okay, uh, Mr. Aslan or Mr. Gannon, either one, um, you've been sworn, you've both been sworn. And, yeah. uh, and um, were you both there that evening? I was not, uh, Mr. Lennon was. Okay, Mr. Gannon, on, on that evening, could you describe the process you had for entry into the premises? Um, it, you, you obviously reviewed the, the video, but the process on the exterior and the system to um, get into the premises. So the procedure we have at Bijou is the door guy, he scans the ID. He asks a couple questions to see if we can get them off, uh, off guard. The holograms. So you broke up. I don't know if the board heard it, but um, you you basically did you say that he scans the ID and he also asks them questions and he also checks with black light for a hologram before he scans it. Is that correct? Correct. Uh, and and he also he also reviews the their pictures to make sure that the ID is but it uh, corresponds to the the person that's uh, presenting it, is that correct? Did you hear, I'm sorry. That's correct, that is correct. Okay, um, so on, on that evening, uh, anybody who entered the premises was scanned and is that, a, is that a new system or is that a system you've had in place? We've had in place. Uh, are you now in the process of um, securing a new system? So currently we're going to, we, I, the app. So we've been in contact with the representative from HID and we're in the process tenders to have this system behind the bar as a precautionary. So this new system, um, you, you refer to it as HID, and, and that system 
um, was um, uh, presented to you for consideration, at, at least I, I shouldn't say, was recommended to you by um, Sergeant Gallagher and, and Detective Hernandez is a system that's probably the most, most reliable. Is that correct? That is correct. And, and it's take, taken you, what, a couple of months to get qualified to even um, obtain the system, is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Um, so in that that system is a system similar to what the police and the ABCC use to verify IDs? That is correct. As part of that, as part of that system, uh, besides having the scanner at the front door, you can also have a scanner at each um, bar in, in the premises. So any bartender that had, even though everyone was scanned to get into the premises, if any bartender had concerns as to the age of the uh, person, they could also have asked them for their IDs and have it scanned. Is that correct? Correct. Um, I have no further questions of, of either. Um, either uh, person. Um, does the board have any, would like to ask him any questions? Um, just so I know you're gonna send the video over. So the testimony today is that these three individuals were scanned at the door? Yes, they were scanned at okay. the door. It, it clearly shows them being scanned. Um, okay. And I just, I'm just curious, um, were these three individuals known to anyone at this premise? Were they familiar? Were they regulars? Not that can we you, know. can either one of you answer that? No. So it sounds like the video that you'll send over today will demonstrate that some, all IDs were scanned. I'll take a look at it myself. Some were scanned and turned away. So you're, I think you're, leading us to believe that the ID scanning um, device you had picked up on some fake IDs, but may not have picked up on these three. Is that what you're saying? That's correct. You can see, actually, it's either the, there's two, two young men, either right before these three or right after these three, which are, are turned away. So the men that were turned away, their IDs were scanned for sure? Yes, okay. everybody, you can see, you can see, uh, Madam Chair, that um, when the people walk up to the, the man at the door, he has a black light, which he takes okay. the ID. He, he looks at their face. He hits the black light to check for the holograms. And then he turns around and scans the ID uh, okay. in the machine. And then he decides whether they, they're allowed to enter the premises or not. OK. All right, I don't have any. Further questions, Commissioner Curran or Commissioner Saxon? Are these um, fake Massachusetts um, IDs, licenses? These these were not. Um, they were not. They were various states. They were various states. They were not mass licenses, no. Okay. And um, did the did the addresses on the licenses? Were they actually the addresses of the individuals? Do you know? Yes. So, like, questions about their addresses wouldn't trip them up. Correct, because everything everything on these fake IDs contain their correct information, other than their date of birth and the license number is not 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 real. Okay, and does did anyone from the um, Bar have any knowledge of these various jurisdictions about what security features are on them and what to look for? So, Mete or or um, you're you're the guy checking the IDs with uh, familiar with the features of each of those IDs to make sure that they were um, accurate. I, I well accurate, other than the fact that they were fraudulent, but. Uh, consistent with IDs from those jurisdictions from those various states? 
Yeah, consistent uh, with the imaging. Yes, and that's from the for, that's from the book that uh, you receive with the with the scanning device. Correct. That's all I have. Nothing from me. Thank you. And um, yeah, just uh, you know, as as the. Um, Sergeant Gallagher and Detective Fernandez have informed uh, not only this this uh, premise but other premises that as fast as these scanning devices upgrade their systems to um, deal with fraudulent the, the uh, fraudulent IDs change so the um, the the system that they're going with is much more expensive but. Um, it's highly recommended by the uh, not only Boston Police but the ABCC. So uh, we're going to invest in that system ASAP. Thank you, Attorney Miller, and we will review that video footage and make sure it is added to the record and shared with the board uh, once we receive it. So thank you. Thank you very much. Yep, the board will take this matter under advisement. Thank you. Now calling item number six, Fuente Cleaning Services, Inc. doing business as Bilaris, Columbia, located at 28 Bennington Street in East Boston. Date of the incident, November 6, 2021. Failure to adhere to licensing board guidelines regarding window covering in violation of Mass General Laws, Chapter 138, Section 64. Who is present on behalf of the licensee? Quedanias. I'm sorry, can you please repeat your name for the record? Definitely Pedanias. Okay, and who is present on behalf of the Boston Police Department? Sergeant Detective William Gallagher. Thank you. And are there any other individuals uh, with firsthand knowledge of the alleged incident who wish to testify today? Detective Hernandez, if needed. Great. Thank you. Uh, can you please all raise your right hand? Thank you. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. I do. I do. Great. Sergeant Gallagher, please proceed with the police report. Yes. On 11-6-2021 at 2320 hours, Sergeant Detective William Gallagher, Detective Eddie Hernandez, assigned to the license premise unit, conducted a license premise inspection in Bilatus, Columbia at 28 Bennington Street. Detectives were aware that there had been an agreement between the Boston Licensing Board and Bilatus, Columbia, that there would be no signs or coverings of premises front windows, an ID scanner and security plan on file. This agreement allowed Bilaris and several other licensed premises in the area to resume normal hours for closing. On this evening, detectives observed the front windows of Bilaris, Columbia to be covered with an adhesive that prevented the officers from looking in while on patrol. As a result of what detectives had observed, Sergeant Detective Gallagher issued a license premise inspection notice number 044-651 to Bilaris, Columbia for failure to adhere to licensing board guidelines regarding window covering, Mr. Freme Restrepo signed for and accepted the notice uh, attached to the report. I'm not sure if you can see them, but we do have photographs of the windows that evening that we observed. We could not look in from the street and see anything going on inside. And we spoke to management about that and uh, we issued a violation. Those essentially are the facts. Thank you. And uh, would the licensee like to address the alleged incident? Mr. Perenias, I believe you said? Yes, how are you? Uh, good morning. So um, when the officer came, I asked him that she wanted me to remove him, but I want to tell the board why we have him up. What happened was uh, back in 2020, when we, the COVID hit us, uh, we had to close down, we had to shut down. So what we, we did was we covered the windows with the signs saying Bijadis Columbia, and there was a pool so that people could remember us because we were shut down for 13 months. So we just wanted to put a picture of people, oh, that's, they're still there, they're still there because we were shut down, we couldn't open because of the COVID. But then when the COVID came, um, it was good that that I asked the officer and we spoke to one of the captains, which I don't remember his name, but he's not there. And we told him, do you mind having the, the windows like this? And he advised us that no, he didn't have a problem. He had a problem before because we had, too many incidents, but now he didn't have a problem and we let it. And now what I'm seeing is the, the second thing that I wanted to address the board is that 
when people, let's say, they don't want people outside, outside the street. They want everybody to clear the street right away. And the officer, Sean, which is one of the officers that helps us at nighttime, he knows that people go and they just peek. They look inside and see who's there and they'll wait outside. So that's why that's another thing that we don't want. We don't want people to peek in inside and they're just going to sit outside and wait for people to come out the club to see where they're going to go. They're going to go to an after party. But if the board wants me to take them down, I'm more than happy to take them down. But to, to my, I just wanted to say that I think it's better like that. We never have a problem with the police. They can come in. The officer can say we are very cooperative with them. We always try to do whatever is best for the community, for everybody, for the cops, for us. So if you guys want me to take it down, I don't have a problem with it. But I think it, the, the way it is, is that, that people are not outside gathering outside and waiting for other people to come because there's actually three bars right next to each other. That's what I got to say. But if you guys want me to take it down, I'm more than happy to take them down. Thank you. Chairman Joyce, any questions? I do have questions. Um, I have the picture in front of me here. It's um, attached to the license premise violation. Um, and maybe it's for Detective Gallagher, Sergeant Detective Gallagher. The windows I'm looking out at on the front where it says the, the bottom left window is completely covered. And then it looks like, I don't know, a disco ball or something. Are those totally opaque? Or can you see? You can't see really, you can probably just see shadows through them. On the right side door, there was some political signs. It was an election yeah. year. But in the front, it was like a, a laminate that you, you really couldn't look in. And I mean, this goes back several years ago. There were a lot of incidents down there. And the, that was the agreement. They rolled back the premises hours. There were three places. And uh, this was one of them. And in order for these guys to reopen, they had to adhere to that. So you really can't see in. It's, you know, <laughs> They've changed. We haven't had any problems down there, which is good. But uh, we just remember what the old rulings were, and uh, yeah. you know, we just walked in and talked about it, and figured the board maybe want to rehash it. Okay, because because that security and operational plan goes back to 2019. I was chair at the time, and I do remember this being an issue. Um, I'm going to suggest that um, you know, are they the only establishment in this area that has their windows covered? Yes, yeah, so, so we, we have we have had to talk to others about the blinds, right? Uh, down and say, listen, they got to be up. And sometimes they forget. Sometimes it, it it depends who opens, you know. Right. I'm going to suggest you don't do any make any changes to your establishment that go against. Are you still here? Okay. I, that, I go can't. Against, that, that go against. Give me one second. Okay. I can't really hear you. Okay. Well, we, um, can you hear me now? No, I'm going to let the me, I'm going to let the other commissioners ask some questions. But in general, I would I would urge you not to make any changes that go against your security and operations plan without written permission of the board. Yes. So, do you want me to take them down? We're going to vote on Thursday. If you don't mind holding on, I'm going to let Commissioner Saxon and Commissioner Curran um, ask you some questions. Should they have any? I don't have any questions. Thank you. Uh, more of a comment, just that I think that the solution to people maybe peeking in and hanging outside um, really lies within your existing duty to, um, you know, police the, the adjacent area of your of your place. So if that's going on, um, I think you have to work that out with your staff and your door staff, not um, cover up the windows. I, I don't know if covering up the windows whether or not it's going to be voted as being a problem still i don't think covering the windows is a solution to that problem so it's more of a comment thank you okay. any further questions from the board nope seeing none the board will take this matter under advisement thank you thank you now calling item number seven, Apple New England LLC, doing business as Applebee's Neighborhood Grill and Bar, located at 11A Allstate Road in Dorchester. Date of the incident, November 8th, 2021. Persons under 21 in possession of alcohol on premise in violation of Mass General Laws, Chapter 138, Section 34A, 34C, and 64 to 64A. Who is present on behalf of the licensee? 
Yes, good morning. David Gill, Area Director with Applebee's. And with me is uh, Billy Andrews, who's the General Manager at the location. Thank you. And who is present on behalf of the Boston Police Department? Sergeant Tech, William Gallagher. Thank you. And are there any other individuals with personal knowledge of the incident who wish to testify on this matter? Detective Hernandez, if needed. Thank you. Can you all please raise your right hand? Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. I do. I do. Thank you. Sergeant Gallagher, you may proceed with the police report. Yes, on 11 8 2021 at 10 20 p.m., Sergeant William Gallagher, Detective Eddie Hernandez, signed to the license premise unit, conducted a license premise inspection of Applebee's restaurant at 11A Allstate Road. Side the premise, detectives observed two young looking females sitting at the far end of the bar with two glasses of what detectives discovered to be doubled shots of Patron tequila. Detectives approached the two, identified themselves as BPD officers and requested IDs to confirm their ages. Neither female had their identification on them. One of the two stated she had a picture of it on her phone. Detectives informed the female that pictures of IDs are not acceptable. This time, both females became agitated, stating that they were pick, being picked on because of their race. Detectives informed the two that if they looked under 21, sitting at a bar with double shots of alcohol in front of them, detectives were well within their rights to check their IDs for proof of age. One of the females was found to be under 21 years of age. Her name was Joanna Pina, 12-22-2000. The second female was identified as Nina Mendez, 12-14-98. Detective Hernandez verified both females' information through RMB records checks and sieges. Sergeant Gallagher inquired with the bartender who was identified as McElhaney Joey Adud, 9799 as to whether he carded both females. Mr. Adud stated that Miss Mendez is his baby's mother and he knows Miss Pena. Mr. Dude stated he didn't ask for IDs because he knew both of them. Detectives informed Mr. Adud that persons under 21 should not be sitting at the bar with alcohol directly in front of them. All young looking patrons must display an actual ID, not a picture on one's phone. Detectives sought out the manager, Ronnie Belazer, and relayed their findings to him, showing him what they had discovered. Mr. Belazer informed detectives that he would speak to all his employees about the incident and apologize for the behavior of some of his employees who interjected themselves into the inspection, causing a scene. As a result of what detectives had observed, Sergeant Gallagher issued a licensed premise inspection notice number 044655 to Applebee's for persons under 21 in possession of alcohol on premise and for an expired City of Boston entertainment license having expired back on 12-31-2020. Mr. Ronnie Belazer signed for and accepted the notice. Detectives will seek criminal complaints against Ms. Joan Pena for being a person under 21 in possession of alcohol. Based on the facts that Ms. Mendez and Mr. McInerney knew Ms. Pena, and Mrs. McElhaney failed to ask for ID prior to alcohol service, they'll be summoned into court. Ms. Nina Mendez and Mr. McElhaney will be summoned into court for procuring alcohol for a person under 21. Those essentially are the facts of that evening. Thank you. Mr. Gill, would you like to address the alleged incident? Yes, thank you, members of the board, and uh, thank you, Sergeant Detective Gallagher and Detective Hernandez. Um, two things that, that I'd like to bring up and address if I could. Uh, the expired entertainment license that was hanging um, goes underneath the current uh, in the permit box, which was taken down um, to send for uh, somebody within our organization, and it wasn't put back uh, correctly. So the next day, uh, the current uh, was posted as it should be. Um, so we are also uh, up to date through the end of 2022 with the license, but I think it was a matter of posting taking it down to send in um, for verification within our organization. And then uh, it, it, they forgot to simply put it back up. This isn't even an entertainment violation hearing. So we're just focused on the uh, alcohol violation. Okay, uh, thank you. But I just wanted to kind of explain what that problem was. Thank and you. as far as uh, the, the serving of the minor, 
a couple of things that I'd like to just bring to the board's attention. Um, first, at, at the direction of Sergeant Detective Gallagher and Sergeant Hernandez, uh, we did implement the HID verification and telecheck. Um, it's a great tool when used properly. Um, I do have uh, uh, over 70 uh, fake IDs that were confiscated. So we're trying to do our due diligence by taking uh, and, and, and taking IDs uh, and, and trying to prevent, you know, minors from drinking. Uh, as far as our employee training goes, we do uh, every year go through a responsible service of alcohol training. That's uh, a combination of videos as well as tests. Um, so we try to hire properly, train properly, and, and make sure that we hold them accountable to standards of serving proper alcohol and responsive, responsible service of alcohol. I think what we have here is a situation where the bartender uh, was very familiar with the patrons, uh, unfortunately chose to do the wrong thing despite having the knowledge of what should be done, uh, broke protocol for not checking the identifications, certainly broke protocol for serving a minor. Um, and for that, he was terminated immediately uh, upon investigation of what we found out. So I don't believe that uh, there's any other facts that I could bring um, for a conversation, but I'd certainly open it up for any questions that you have. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Gill. So um, you now have a scanner system in place? It has been in place all along. Um, unfortunately, this bartender, uh, honestly, I believe that he knew the patrons and chose to do the wrong thing. He was trying okay. to do it. And in the moment, because he, uh, I believe one of the women was the mother of his child. Um, they came in for takeout that night. They weren't even into the bar. They might have recognized him as the bartender came in, and that's when it happened. Okay. Uh, and your testimony is that he made the he was properly trained, but he made the wrong decision and he broke protocol. One hundred percent. So, in the police report, uh, Sergeant, maybe you can provide a little more color to this. It says that the, someone apologized for the way the other staff had interjected themselves. With, it sounds like a, a fight occurred. Um, no. when you guys are IDing them or something? Correct. Uh, they, you know, a lot of times deflection is, uh, probably their best defense. And they started, Hey, you're picking on us. And, uh, some of the staff members, I, you know, I feel that the uh, general manager here is correct. This was sabotage from within. And, uh, I think a lot of the employees also probably knew these females from the relationship they had with the bartender. And uh, they, they came to their defense. Okay. Uh, manager, we talked to apologize for the behavior. He noticed what was going on. We told him what was going on. And, uh, you know, he just had them all quiet down, and let us do our job. But we were outnumbered at first, but uh, we don't take it personal. Okay. Thank you. I don't have any other questions. Commissioner Saxon or Commissioner Curran, do you? Nothing further from me. Thanks. I don't. Thank you. Thank you. The board will take this matter under advisement. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Calling item number eight, Russian Benevolent Society doing business as Crystal Restaurant Garage Room located at 14 to 20 Linden Street in Alston. Date of the incident, November 15th, 2021. Assault and battery with a dangerous weapon and gun in violation of Mass General Laws, Chapter 138, Section 64 and Chapter 265, Section 15A. Assault and battery patron on patron in violation of Mass General Laws, Chapter 138, Section 64, and Chapter 265, Section 13A. Assault and battery patron on employee in violation of Mass General Laws, Chapter 138, Section 64, and Chapter 265, Section 13A. Failure to call 911 in violation of Mass General Laws, Chapter 138, Section 64, and Boards Rule 1.14b. And failure to cooperate with police in violation of Mass General Laws, Chapter 138, Section 64, and Boards Rule 1.10a and b. Who is present on behalf of the licensee? Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the board, Attorney Kurt Bletzer for the Russian Benevolent Society. I also have with me uh, Alex Matov, who is the manager of record, Alex Shapiro, who was the manager on duty that night, and Jesse Omard, who was the head of the security group that evening. Thank you. And who is present on behalf of the Boston Police Department? Detective Sean McCarthy, District 14. Thank you, Detective. And uh, are there any other individuals with firsthand knowledge of the incident who wish to testify on this matter today? Sergeant Detective William Galley will just be reading the uh, issuance of the LPV into record, but no direct knowledge. 
Thank you. Can you all please raise your right hand? Um, Detective McCarthy, are you on? Oh, great. I see you now on the screen. Uh, all right. Do you all swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Yeah, I do. Thank you. And who will be reading the police report? Is that Detective McCarthy or Sergeant Gallagher? I'm Detective Slucci. I can read the report. Okay, great. Thank you. Please go ahead. About uh, 0035 on November 15, 2021. D-14 officers responded to 20 Linden Street, the garage, for a report of a person shot. Um, officers and EMS arrived and found the victim uh, suffering from a gunshot wound to the face in uh, the parking lot. Uh, the victim was transported to the Mass General Hospital where he was treated for his injuries. Uh, he was later identified as Edward Miles, date of birth 5-16-82. Um, that's basically what happened that evening. Okay. Thank you, Sergeant Gallagher. Sure, on 11-18-2021 at about 8 p.m., Sergeant Detective Salucci, Sergeant Detective Gallagher, Detective Hernandez, Detective Relipid, Detective McCarthy went to the garage slash Russian Benevolent Society at 20 Linden Street, Austin. The purpose of this visit included follow-up investigation into an incident that occurred both inside the garage nightclub and on their property and in the parking lot. During the incident which occurred on 11 15 2021 at 1 55 a.m., two individuals were shot. The assault and battery took place inside between patrons on patrons and patrons on staff. BPD records show no 911 calls were placed from the premise to BPD alerting them of the incident, and staff members refused to identify themselves or cooperate in the first stages of the investigation. On the night of the 18th, BPD officers waited at 20 Linden Street for about 15 minutes and were informed that the manager, Alex Matov, would not be showing up. Furthermore, detectives were advised to contact counsel attorney Kurt Bletzer should there be any further questions. BPD officers were also made aware that the garage would be closed for the next two weeks. As a result of this incident, in what detectives had learned, Sergeant Detective Gallagher issued a license premise inspection notice number 005324 the garage slash Russian Benevolent Society for assault and battery dangerous weapon times two assault and battery patron on patron, assault and battery patron on employee, and failure to call 911, failure to cooperate with police. This inspection notice will be mailed to Mr. Alex Matov, manager of Russian Benevolent Society, 20 Linden Street, Austin, Mass. 02134. Those are the facts we have. Thank you. Attorney Bletzer, would you like to address the alleged incident? Yes, if I may. If I may ask Sergeant Detective Gallagher. Sergeant Detective, how was it determined uh, that there was no 911 call placed from the uh, establishment? Uh, we went back to the records with uh, the uh, detectives from District 14, and we checked the uh, the Boston Police CAD to uh, confirm that the numbers were from the premise. Uh, but there were, there were cell phone calls made to the BPD that evening, correct? I believe they were. Were you, do you have a, a log of the 911 calls that were made to the station or to 911? I, I do not have that, sir. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I, I detect a copy here. I do have a log and I, uh, I called just about every 911 caller on that uh, cash sheet. Uh, do you have a uh, call from 617-610-9796? I have to go back and check my uh, my records. I'm not in the office today. I'm actually on vacation. Uh, I do have uh, for the board. Um, I do have a log which I will send in from Alex Shapiro, who was the manager on duty that night, with a 911 call at 12:30 a.m. and the police report. The police responded to a radio call at 12:35. I've just been uh, able to obtain that, so I will scan that and send that into the board. That's regarding the 911 call. Okay. Thank you. And Detective Gallagher, was there any other follow up um, with the establishment after the appointment on 1118, to your knowledge? Not that I know of, sir. No. Okay. In terms of the investigation, were there any, any arrests made? You'd have to relay those questions to District 14, sir. Okay. Uh, Detective McCarthy, um, you 
Yeah, you re- did you respond that evening? You responded that evening, correct? I responded to the hospital that evening. You did not respond to the establishment? Nope. And after the incident the next day, uh, you had conversations with the manager, Alex Shapiro, correct? Correct. And you went to the establishment the next day and went through, and he took you through and went over the incident that day, correct? I don't know if it was the next day. I'd have to go back and check my case notes. Okay. But it was prior to the 18th, correct? Like I said, I'd have to go back and check my notes to see exactly what day I followed up at the garage. Okay. And you and I had a conversation also, correct? That's correct. Okay. And I reached out to you to let you know that we were there to help him whatever way we could, correct? Yes, sir. And uh, you were also given Joe Sweeney's information, who is the IT guy for the for the establishment, correct? That's right. And Mr. Sweeney provided you with a videotape, and he also provided you with the actual recorder for the establishment, correct? Uh, we had to seize the recorder because the video that Mr. Sweeney had provided lacked what I believe to be key moments in the incident. It was, uh, it was incomplete and not all the footage I had asked for. Well, when you say seize, you asked for them to give it to you and they gave it to you, correct? Yes. Okay, but you didn't get a warrant. You didn't have to get a warrant. They cooperated and gave you the video machine, correct? I got a search warrant for the actual DVR itself to view the uh, contents of it. Did you get a DVR or search warrant prior to them giving you the the uh, machine? No. All right. So isn't it true they gave you the machine so you could do whatever you needed to do with it, correct? Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Okay. And were you able to determine and go through the video footage? From the DVR? From the machine itself. From the machine. That is still being analyzed by uh, our department specialists. Okay. And you had conversations with Joe Sweeney, correct? Yes. Joe Sweeney was cooperating, cooperated with you on that? Yes. Okay. And have you had any further follow-up with the establishment? You know what? I've been trying to follow up with the security staff. I believe the garage contracts a security company run by Mr. Omar. I followed up with him and I asked him for a list of employees um, who were working there that night. And he said he was in Texas and he would get it to me. He never got that to me. So I'm not sure if Mr. Ahmad is employed by the garage or, or if he's an independent uh, security. Specialist. Mr. Ahmad is an independent security specialist that, that uh, we contract with to do security. He is on the hearing with us today. Okay. If there's anything you need from him, he'll get you whatever you need. Okay, because he didn't get me what I needed. Uh, and, I, and I contacted him uh, well over a month ago about a list of his employees. And he, he seemed kind of dismissive. Well, he was traveling at the time you talked to him, wasn't he? Yeah, but I would think that Mr. Omar, uh, you know, being a business owner, would realize the gravity of the situation and would think as soon as I get back to Boston, I think it would be important to uh, reach out to this detective to, to get him what he needs to conduct this investigation. And did you reach out to him further after that uh, phone call? No, I didn't. Okay. Um... If I may uh, have Mr. Omad testify. Right Mr. Omad, can you identify yourself, please? Hello. Um, excuse me. I'm the uh, owner of the uh, contracted uh, for the garage boss. And were you there on the uh, night of the incident that this uh, yes. violation hearing is for November 15th? Yes, the I night of November 14th into the 15th? You present? Correct. I was there. Okay. Yes, I was. And what happened inside uh, that was the cause of the uh, initial incident inside? Uh, initially, there were some patrons that were being a little bit belligerent, uh, dancing on tables and chairs, um, which I ordered the security team to get them to get down off of the furniture. Um, that's when they got a little abrasive and got physical. Um, between some groups, we dispersed the groups, which we left one half of the problem inside 
and escorted the other half out. Uh, we don't send both parties out because then that causes problems within the outside. So as we kept one in, the other half, we made sure that they left. Uh, so we thought they left. Um, what happened outside? Time, what happened outside at that point? Well, at that point in time, like I said, we escorted um, the other side away from the premises and kept the other side in. Um, at that point in time, people were still upset. So that's when we decided to end the night uh, before anything escalated. All right. Did, uh, did the lights go on and close, uh, close the establishment at that point? That is correct. Lights went on. Announcements were made that that is the end of the night. And can everybody disperse to their cars and leave the premises? And did you have security outside dispersing the parties from the parking lot? Oh, uh, yes. In and outside. We have okay. uh, what? security at the, at the door, um, outside and inside. And what happened outside? Uh, outside, I guess another argument had dispersed um, from some of the people that were talking stated that some guys came from out of the parking lot and came back down the, the walkway. Um, and shortly after, maybe some words, a blow was thrown and then a shot was fired. And how many shots were fired? Uh, from, my, from my knowledge, one. Okay. What happened next? Um... Well, we shut the doors um, to try to get the, the crowd that was already outside dispersed out of the area. Um, a lot of people were trying to run back in, but mostly everyone was outside already. Um, as we dispersed the rest of the, the crowd that was outside, um, we tried to give medical attention to the person that was actually shot um, and get everybody else off the premises. And how many guys could shot that night? Uh, I believe it was two. From what I heard, it went through one patron's shoulder and hit the second person in the mouth. And which person were you giving aid to? Uh, well, the person that got shot in the shoulder, I believe they took themselves to the hospital. So we tried to help the uh, the, the second um, patron that actually got hit in the mouth. Um, he was kind of out of it. You know, he was running around and moving. We were trying to get him to sit down, uh, which eventually, you know, he kind of collapsed and stayed in one place. Okay. And then what happened next? Did the police come? Uh, the police came uh, a little bit after that. Uh, we were still dispersing the area because there was a lot of people that were trying to take videos and social media, and we were trying to get the place cleared so that the police can come and do their job. And what happened when the police got there? Um, when they first got there, I approached them. Um, I let them know who I was and what they needed from me. Uh, they asked me a few questions, which was, where did it happen? I showed them the area where it happened. They asked me uh, questions as far as did anyone see the firearm, what it looked like. Um, and then we pretty much was just searching the area for shells at that point in time. I asked the rest of my security to continue to disperse the area. Okay. And uh, did the did the area disperse at that point? Did all the uh, patrons for the most part. For the most part, yes. I, I would say over 90% of everyone was gone at that point in time. There were still a few lingering. Like I said, they were the ones taking the videos. But um, as BPD was trying to get rid of them, we also uh, helped them get rid of those last few stragglers. Okay. And then at some point, uh, were all the patrons dispersed? Uh, yes. Um, there really wasn't any patrons left. Uh, it was more just the employees and maybe a couple promoters, but for the most part, everyone was gone. Okay. And then did uh, more police officers come at that point? I believe there was like a sergeant or someone else that uh, came a little bit later. I can't remember his name. And it looks like a, 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 I don't know if they considered a gang unit or more of a tactical unit, but they arrived uh, uh, last. They were in all black. And did anybody take any witness statements of any, or of any of the, of the uh, patrons prior to dispersing them? Not of my knowledge. Like I say, stated they were more concerned with finding a shell casing, um, and getting people out of the area, um, which, like I stated, we, we, we helped them do so. We, I was and actually advised to get, I was actually advised to help get everyone out because whoever's left is going to be stuck when, when, the, when the yellow tape goes up. That's the exact words that was told to me. Okay. And was the uh, person that got shot able to identify who the shooter was? From my knowledge, no, he wasn't necessarily, um, 
coherent enough to really speak. He was kind of like in and out, and he was bleeding profusely from the mouth. Do you know if he knew who the individual was that shot him? Not to my knowledge. Like, uh, there was so many things going on. Like I said, we were more focused on clearing the area and getting the EMT, EMTs to be able to come in and help him. So there wasn't much talking as far as asking. I don't know if they asked him, but that, that wasn't something that was to my knowledge. And did you and your staff help and cooperate with the police at that time? 100%. And how many uh, staff members did you have on duty that night? Uh, that night, it was seven. Okay. And then uh, at some point, uh, did the yellow tape go up, as you said? I didn't see any yellow tape. It was more, they kind of just blocked the gateway and told everyone that they can't leave without giving up some information. Okay, and what information were they looking for? Uh, they're pretty much just asking for your identification, your name, contact information. That's what they were asking for. All right. Did you give them your contact information? Correct. That's the reason why the lieutenant, or I'm not sure if he's a detective, he's the one that reached out to me. I gave him all my information. Okay. And did your, did your uh, employees give you their information? They did. Um, it did take a few minutes because there was a another, um, I don't know if he was a patron or uh, a promoter, but they were having an altercation with him. So they kind of put us to the side because they were arguing with that other person. And was he the DJ? Was but he not the Was he the I'm DJ? Not sure that if he was a DJ or if he was a promoter. I don't believe he was a DJ. I believe he was either a promoter or a friend of maybe the DJs, but he wasn't someone that was working with us. Okay. And what was the altercation? What was the, the issue that the police had with him? Well, the, the, the issue is um, he asked, was, you know, he suspected of committed a crime. Is he being detained? They told him no. So he said, well, if that's the case, then I don't need to identify myself. So that's where the standoff came in at. How long did that last? Uh, I want to say it lasted over half an hour, 45 minutes, because I stood there and waited in the rain just to kind of help with the situation. Um, I was actually even telling him, you know, just give your information. And he was just adamant on not giving it. So I was actually talking to him because I known him from around the area. Um, and he just didn't want to do so. So I know I eventually I had to leave and I was there for at least half an hour during that standoff. So it, I, I couldn't tell you how longer it lasted after that. And did the police eventually know who it was? Uh, I believe so. Uh, if, uh, if I remember, he was even, he was okay with giving the information. It's just, they were telling him he wasn't detained, but he couldn't leave. And I think he was just, you know, stressing his rights. Um, I'm not too sure how it ended but he told me that they eventually just let him go. Okay. And did you have follow-up uh, conversations with Detective McCarthy? Um, is that is that the same uh, detective that was uh, stated that he called me? Yes. Um, I had that one conversation with him in Texas, and that's what I wanted to clear up that, that um, I felt was something incorrect. When I told him that I was in Texas, uh, and I gave him whatever, I, he asked me two questions, the same things that you're asking me. I gave him all of that information. He did state that he wanted to get um, the names of the people that were working, but he stated since I was out of town, when was I coming back? I told him then when I was coming back in a few days, and he stated that he would reach back out to me when I was back in town so that I can, he can get that information. I never received any follow-up calls. So I wasn't supposed to contact him. He said he was going to contact me because I gave him the date that I was coming back. And he said that we would go further from there. Well, that may have been a misunderstanding, obviously, between the two of you. But obviously, you had a conversation. Understandable. You... Yeah. Okay. And all I right. gave him whatever, whatever questions they needed answered. I, I gave them that information. I gave them all my contact information. I haven't hidden or anything. If they wanted to get more information to contact, I'm fully able to do so. That's why I'm okay. here today. All right. Thank you. Uh, Alex Shapiro, um, if I may, uh, members of the board, ask Alex Shapiro a couple of questions. Alex, you there? Yes. All right. And Alex, you were working that night, correct? Correct. All right. And when the police came, did you cooperate with the police? Of course. Okay. And um, did you call 911? Yes. Okay. And what time did you call 911? 
approximately 12.30 a.m. And that's the, uh, that's the sheet that you were able to get this morning, which shows that your phone made a, that your phone made a 12.30 a.m. call and 11.15 to 911, correct? Yes. Okay. And you had a two-minute conversation with uh, yep. the operator, correct? Correct. Um, and that evening you cooperated with the police and gave them your information, correct? Yes. And you have had follow-up conversations with Detective McCarthy, correct? Correct. And you met with him the next day, is that correct? Uh, correct. Okay. And you went through uh, what had happened that evening and took him for a tour through the, through the establishment, correct? Correct. Okay. And then he had follow-up with you and you were supposed to have a meeting with him on the 18th, correct? Correct. What happened, what happened with that meeting? Uh, admittedly, I got tied up in a uh, family emergency. Uh, I then texted him and asked him to contact my attorney uh, to set up another meeting, uh, to which he responded, so you're not coming tonight? I said, uh, no, I'm sorry. Uh, I was really tied up, and uh, I never heard anything else, um, although I was cooperative and still am. Right, and you, uh, you were aware that Joe Sweeney, who's our IT guy, was going to give the VCR machine to the Boston police, correct? Correct. All right. And you guys did that at their request, correct? Correct. You, were you ever shown a warrant or anything from the police? No. Okay. Right. I have no further questions at this time. If I may just address the board. Sure. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Um, again, the uh, I will send into the board the nine one one call was made from um, Alex's phone. I will represent that that is his number. Uh, I didn't ask him that, but but, but I have called that number many times. The number that I'm going <coughs> to send you in the six one zero number is his telephone number, and it shows a twelve thirty call to 911, a two minute call to 911. Um, the, the individuals all, all cooperated that evening. There was an incident that occurred that escalated outside. Um, whether the individual that, that did the shooting was in the bar, we aren't sure, we can't tell from the video, although I'm sure the detectives will be able to determine that. Um, there was a subsequent video uh, that I gave to Detective Gallagher that shows, uh, actually shows the shooting. Uh, the videotape was given to the Boston police. The establishment cooperated with the police that night and continues to cooperate today. Whatever else they need, we're happy to happy to give to them. Um, this particular incident that happened inside was broken up. And again, as I said, I'm not sure why it escalated or how it turned into what it turned into outside. But we had certainly had uh, plenty of security on that night. We had uh, plenty of individuals to police the area. Um, how this happened, uh, obviously, is depending on the people that, that came in there that evening. Um, it's an unfortunate incident that happened, and we will continue to, to cooperate with the police, whatever else we need to do at this point. Thank you, Chairman Joyce. Any questions? Right. Can I jump back on there? Sure. Absolutely. Um, I missed the paragraph in the police report where the uh, second victim uh, self applied to Brigham Women's Hospital with a gunshot wound. That was Mr. Jermaine Cohen, 6891. And uh, that evening when we, when we responded there, we weren't aware of a second victim. And it seems at this time that that security gentleman was aware that there was a second victim. And we, we were not made aware of that until at least an hour after the incident when this gentleman self-applied and called the police. And uh, Detective McCarthy went from Mass General to the Brigham to interview the second victim. And the gentleman also said that we asked him to escort everybody out without we were getting everybody's names and identification as witnesses that's where the 
incident happened with the uh, promoter where he would not give his name and wouldn't give us uh wouldn't help us out as a witness that's why he he held the whole crowd up so we weren't asking them to get rid of the whole crowd we wanted to get everybody's name every possible witness there so and he mentioned that they were there filming social media stuff and if he's aware of any social media stuff it'd be nice if he could hand that over to us because we're not aware of any social media stuff besides the stuff that uh attorney Blesser gave us like two days ago but which, which shows the actual shooting yeah that's so. uh that's the only uh video that we've been able to obtain that somebody ended up sending to uh to us for one of the uh, promoters but they were when we say security, social media your security uh gentleman has is aware more well no i think said, what he's he true. said there was a lot of people filming at the time of the incident so if he's aware of any it'd be nice if he shared it with us well, well, we know he, he's not he's not aware of any that's on on social media his point was that people were taking videos with the cameras after the fact people were taking yeah, videos he's, of, he's aware of uh Pete, it seems like he knows a lot of those people there and if he could reach out to those people that he knows and provide us with the videos you know because he he knew everybody there he knew the general the promoter who wouldn't give us his name you know if they, if he just cooperated and gave us the gentleman's name we could have let the gentleman go and would have cleared up the scene and we could have got to our job a lot faster that night. I don't think he knew his full name. I, I, I didn't. He said he knew him. Jesse, do you know his full name? Do you know what his name and address is? No, oh, I don't. I said I know him from around the area. I didn't say I know his full name. Um, another thing is, I only, I only know him by his name that they call him Blue. I don't know his name. He's the person that he's around. That's Have you received any social him. media stuff? Are you aware no, of any I'm other videos any. of the incident? Are you aware no, of any other like, videos like, of the like incident? Stated, not at this time? No, or? like I stated. Like I stated, because you weren't there at that moment when we were told to clear the area. The moment that you had the conversation with the promoter, everyone was gone. Yeah, but he's asking, are you it's aware of any going, other... Jesse, are you aware of any other social media posts that have any video of the incident that night? No, I answered that. No, I'm not aware of any other videos. Okay. You just, your point was if that you I, saw was, people, but your point is you saw people video. taking video. Correct. So we, there was people okay, that were taking any, video. If you have any, you can just share with us. That's fine. And, well and another, thing, another thing, the um, were there two fights in the club before uh, the shooting? There was one fight that we were with a, with a handful of people. Alex sh That's showed us two areas. Stopped. Alex showed us two areas where there were fights and one of them involved one of your staff members, correct? That was the same altercation. One was in front of like the DJ booth and one was up in the uh, private section. Correct. That's the same altercation. They're right next to each other, the same people, the handful of people. That that is why you guys were cited for not calling nine one one. You called after the shooting, but you didn't call after the fight where you escorted people out. And you, one of your one of your staff members was involved in the fight, correct? That's correct, because he got hit with a bottle or so, or something of, of that nature. No, you didn't call nine one one. You didn't call nine one one, right? That again? You didn't call 911 after that happened, right? You only called after the shooting, right? Well, I'm breaking up a fight. I don't know if I'll be able to call 911 when I'm the one in the middle of it. Were you actually involved in breaking up the fight? I was there, sir. Were you involved in breaking up the fight itself, the physical fight? Yes. Okay, what were you wearing that night? There was a handful of people. I was wearing all black, just like my security does. And, and this fight is directly related to the shooting that happened outside. This was a carry over I, carried over incident. I couldn't answer that question. I wasn't outside during the shooting. Yeah, but, but as a security supervisor, you must know what's going on inside the club and outside the club. That's kind of your responsibility, right? It's my responsibility to you know what two different situations happen in two different areas. Absolutely it is. That's why you have staff members. I gave you the information. 
that I got from what I heard. If I wasn't there to see it, I can't give you what I didn't see. I can give you what I heard of. I heard the gunshot, and I told you exactly where it happened at when I came outside. I can only give you what I know. We don't, we don't know for a fact that the incident inside is the reason for the incident outside. Correct. Like I because other people, because other areas. people came, other people came down the driveway outside. So we don't know that Correct. they're related. Different situations, two different areas. So I can't be inside dealing with something and tell you exactly what happened outside. That's that's impossible for me to do that. But you had uh, staff posted outside. Right, and our investigation has indicated that we don't know for a fact that they were related. We just can't, we can't say that for, for a fact. Correct. And one more question for uh, Mr. Omad and, uh, and I'll ask you, Attorney Bledsoe, um, since you are representing uh, Mr. Shapiro, based on witness interviews I conducted, it seems to be that each promoter had brought in their own kind of security detail. Is that true? Uh, the promoter had a couple of guys at the door with him, yes. Okay, so there were two separate security. It was Mr. Romad's security company, and then there were, uh, there were others who were with the promoter that were assigned to security as well? Not to, not to do with us. Okay, but not, there were other security. Okay, so the promoters did bring their own security staff. He, I don't know if you call them security staff, but he had a couple of people with him, yes. Okay, and do we know those promoters' names? Yes. Okay, because we'd like we to don't. speak with them. We have all of that information. Anything you need, we can give you for all those people. Okay, great. Thank you, Attorney Bletzer. Yeah. I just want to ask Boston Police if they have anything else they would like to ask the individuals on the hearing at this moment, because I know it's been very difficult for you to get some answers to your questions up until this point. Detective McCarthy or Sergeant Detective Salucci, do you have anything else you'd like to ask? I want them to share uh, whatever they can share with us. If they get any social media video or they can identify anybody, you know, and just some of the video is missing and it's just, it's the videos there right before the shooting and right after the shooting. It just it didn't make sense to us that the video we wanted is gone, you know? Uh, thank you, Sergeant Detective. Um, the system, and maybe it was, you know, maybe there's some flaws in the system, but okay. they have co-op. Attorney Blesser has cooperated the best he can with his clients. We, uh, I, I did speak to Joe Sweeney about that. Joe Sweeney has no idea what the issue was. That was why he gave the uh, machine over to the BPD to see if they can figure out why there are gaps in it, because there are gaps. I don't know. He doesn't know why. And he's the only person that deals with the video. Nobody else in the place really knows how to use it. It's, uh, it's locked upstairs in the, uh, in the building um, and runs all the security throughout the whole building, because there are other, other uh, tenants in the building. There's a daycare in there and some other, some other, uh, uh, people that are in there so no idea on the video issue but whatever other video we have we'll certainly give to the BPD. Thank you. I want to jump in and, and um, like leave it open for anyone from Boston Police to jump in too if any other questions arise during the commissioner's questioning. Um, so just so I'm clear Alex Shapiro was the manager on duty that night? Yes correct. Okay, but Alex Matov is the manager of record? Correct. And he was the one that Boston police tried to serve with this license premise inspection, but he immediately closed the place for several weeks after this incident? No, I think they, were, they had been talking to Alex Shapiro. They're actually talking, they were talking to Alex Shapiro. I think, uh, I think they thought it was Alex Matov. Okay. Uh, Mr. Matov, you're here on the hearing? Yes. Okay. I just want to reiterate your responsibility as the manager of record for this license premise. Um, you need to be familiar with the rules and regulations of this board, the ABCC and the laws of the Commonwealth. You also need to cooperate with Boston police on any investigation or any Boston police agent 
You need to tell your and advise and train your employees to cooperate with Boston police. We have spent the last several minutes of this public hearing having to do with alcohol violations, um, allowing Boston police to conduct an investigation because they were unable to do so outside of this hearing process. Um, do you understand that? Yes, I do. Okay. Do you, do you educate your, how do you educate your staff, the promoters, the security team about cooperating with Boston police? Everybody who's been hired by the company, uh, being gone through the uh, uh, process, uh, uh, getting to know the uh, police, getting to know the policies, uh, what they need to do. Uh, we've been in business for quite a while and done. I think uh, everybody has uh, has gone through the uh, uh, through the process. So you have a duty not to you have a duty not to hinder or delay a police investigation, as do your employees, your contractors, your security, your promoters. So not to hinder a police investigation means to help out and to assist a police investigation. And we have, and we always done it. Uh, okay. for, uh, our security cameras have been used by District 14 uh, for several times, for several occasions throughout the years on uh, unrelated incidences as to, uh, to our establishment. Uh, so we've been uh, always co uh, cooperating with police. Okay. Um... In District 14, um, you know, this license premise has been a focal point, it, it seems. Um, I don't have all the, the call logs in front of me, but it, it seems that this has um, resulted in um, extra police attention at this location, especially since, uh, especially, you know, last fall, winter during this time. Um, what are you doing, uh, Mr. Matov, to um, not make this a central local focus point of um, Boston police attention? Well, we uh, we've been diligently working to make sure that uh, we're not uh, we're not taking police in District 14's time, precious time that they have. Uh, um, we have decided to shut down the facility for until further notice until we figure out uh, and uh, potentially uh, change some of the staff members and uh, uh, returning to policies. So you're currently shut down. Yes. And what is your plan? Um, when are you thinking about reopening? We don't have this plan at this point. Uh, at this point, we're concentrating on uh, hiring uh, good staff members and revisiting our policy. Okay, and I, I wanna thank uh, Detective McCarthy for taking time out of his vacation for, to join us because it was very difficult for us to get this hearing scheduled. Um, I just wanna ask Sergeant Detective Gallagher or Detective Hernandez, do you have anything you'd like to add? Um, before we move on to the other commissioners for any questions they might have. Madam Chair, just a side check of gallery again. Like I said, that, anyway, that night question. Where's your car? And I live right in this garage. Yeah, Sorry. come right out this way. That night in question, uh, we, we made time to go out there to, uh, to assist District 14. And it was only after that they thought that they weren't getting their fair shake and getting the information they needed. And uh, everyone was there and uh, you know they just, they failed to show we had to issue the uh, LPV via mail, which we've never really done before. Uh, you know, things could have worked better. I, I think District 14 still looking for information and this happened quite a while ago. So uh, I think the facts basically speak for themselves. Detective Fernandez, do you have anything you'd like to add? I apologize. Uh, no, no, I mean, I, th I think the, uh, it does speak for itself. Uh, They've been a very uncooperative. Let's see, it appears. Okay. Um, before I move on to the other commissioners, um, Attorney Bletzer, would you, I know you ha have been working with Boston Police, but um, if there's anything else you or your client or their contractors can do to help with this investigation, I know you will. I hope you'll continue to do so. But I want to move to Commissioner Saxon and Commissioner Curran to see if they have any questions about. Um, about the license premise inspection that's before us today. Um, Attorney Bletzer or anyone uh, from the premises, when you hire um, so-called uh, independent contractors, do you have language in your agreements informing them of their duty to cooperate during Boston police investigations? We do. Uh, we had and we've had conversations with uh, JSG security and uh, they've actually been pretty good. I thought they did a pretty good job with cooperating that night. And uh, yeah, I think I'm more concerned with the, this uh, promoter or TJ 
I, I don't know what he was, but he clearly wasn't following um, our expectations and, and uh, the language you're telling me that it would have been in an agreement when you hired him? Nor ours. And uh, obviously, as we've had conversations with the board and I've had with all of the establishments I represent, the promoters cause a, cause a big problem for all of us because they do what they want to do. And um, we make it clear to these people that they have to listen to us and cooperate with us. Um, we're not really sure uh, the guy blew who he was. I think he was with the promoter. We're still trying to get to the bottom of that part. But I think the police ended up knowing who he was from something else that had happened. I think he's a, actually a Boston school teacher, but he was a real problem that night and really gave a, gave a hard time, I think, to Sergeant Detective Salucci that night, uh, which was totally unwarranted. Um, Commissioner Curran, you're muted. Well, so thank you, I'm sorry. Um, my recollection is, and I'm looking at the uh, our docket, uh, this this premises had a shooting uh, in the parking lot in 2018. Do you recall that? I do. Uh, was anything done in, in response to that incident to screen patrons for weapons and firearms uh, upon entry? Uh, yeah, we screened them. The way this this person came, my understanding from this particular incident was this guy came back down came back down the driveway with the weapon. I'm not really sure how or why, or, uh, you know, if somebody was coming to pick somebody up. Uh, but yeah, they, they pat down at the door. Our security does all that to make sure nobody has weapons. We don't have a metal detector, but we do have, uh, we do have steps in place to uh, pat down and pat frisk people for weapons. Can you describe to me uh, what are like the details that lead you to believe that that was what happened here? It was a video, it was a witness testimony? Well, because we, not witness testimony, just because we didn't have, nobody that we knew of had a weapon inside because they had been frisked. So we believe because there was some cars out in the parking lot in that, in that area, uh, we, we just, uh, I think it was just somebody believing or surmising that's what must have happened. We don't know for a fact. We're not really sure where it comes from. The most recent video uh, that we just gave to, I uh, just gave to Detective Gallagher, was just a quick 10 second cell phone video which shows the shooter go out of the picture and come back in with a gun and take a shot. Is there any um, video camera in the parking lot? There's video cameras everywhere, but video shows things before and after. For some reason, there was no video exactly at the point of the shooting. And trust me, nobody touched the video. There was nothing in it for us to touch the video or for the establishment. Uh, the video guy, Joe Sweeney, is the only guy that touches it, has anything to do with it. He has no idea as to why things cut out when they cut out. We've had trouble. We've had trouble in the past, but we've got good video all throughout the place, inside and outside. I'm just I, like if there's a video in the parking lot, then it would show the person maybe getting to the car, or getting something out. Oh, I think we can tell. I think with the latest video, I think the detective's in a better position to be able to identify the guy that's ultimately the shooter, because you can see, I think you can see who the, who the person was that did the shooting. So it should be easy to see him, whether he comes out of the club or comes down the driveway from the prior, the, just for some reason, the, the, there's a period right before the shooting and during the shooting that's, that's blank for a period of time. But this video before and after, which should show this particular person. Yeah, that, that video, um, it skips intermittently throughout playback. Uh, a minute is missing here. It could be two minutes there. And the, the footage is just incomplete altogether, unfortunately. So this, this is a problem that has occurred with the video um, equipment before? It, it had before, but we, we thought we had it fixed. We thought it was all fixed and we put more cameras in. We actually put more cameras in at the request of, of uh, District 14 to get this whole area down our driveway and get all the entire parking lot. And then we also have the full, we've got a street scene too, to get more of the street. Because there's been incidents that have come through there, not related to our place. 
out on Linden Street. And getting back to the timeline, uh, once again, for whoever can answer, um, the, the altercation that happened inside was, what was the timing versus the shootings? Like, was there minutes gap in between, no gap, over, was it overlapped? What is the time? Because I, I, I still don't have the it, timing of how that went down. It was minutes, probably five, 10 minutes. Everybody was milling out. We were clearing everybody out at that point. Okay, so there was five minutes between this altercations, settlement, and then the shooting. At least five minutes, yes. It, it, and Detective McGonty, I'd like to point out that uh, the video footage from the, uh, the best footage we have from the outside that does show people walking out with drinks, people in the crowd still with drinks in their hands. Um, and, and even a witness I spoke to said the security did a terrible job that night. Actually, several witnesses said the security did a ter terrible job that night. They were instigating people. Um, one, one woman I spoke to said, that if I wanted to get a gun in there, I could have. It wouldn't have been a problem. And it, the, during the, the altercation, were punches thrown? Did I hear something about a bottle being swung or someone being struck by a bottle? I mean, was it, was it pushing no. or shoving or was it a real fight? Like, it, was, it was, what happened was when, when, we took the, when we took the individual off of the table, he pushed one of our security guys who fell and hit and cut himself when he fell. That spilled over into the group next door. There was some pushing and shoving and some, some punches thrown. They were separated. That's when we turned the lights on and closed the place down and cleared the place out at that point. All right, so you had an incident where one of your employees was assaulted and cut. There were punches thrown. And, and so getting back to the point the detective made, there was at least five minutes between that incident and a shooting where there was ample opportunity to call 911 because that incident sounds serious enough to me to call 911 and it wasn't. So the police weren't there and or on their way. And then we had a shooting, correct? Well, we had that incident under control. That was not, you know, again, you we don't a, know that those are even related. You had an employee who had been a, a battered, cut, and punches thrown. Is that not serious enough to call 911? I believe it is, yeah. But again, we were we were clearing the place out at that point to, to get it under control when but the shooting occurred. You said it was cleared. The nine one one was called. You said it was cleared for at least five minutes. Correct. That's all I have. Correct. Um, just for the the contractor, the the um the witnesses, the security person. I'm sorry, I forget your name. Um, you said that. Was, sorry, say that again. Yes, Jesse Omar. Jesse, okay, sorry. Um, so Jesse, uh, can you describe the person who told you that you could clear? Um, what, was it a was it a police officer? Can you just read definitely it? a police officer. It was a police officer, like I stated. So we were clearing the areas. Everybody was going home uh, as the police were coming up the driveway. I greeted them and told them, "I'm the head of security. This is where the situation happened." Whatever you need, we're here. I pointed out even a couple of my other guys that were there, and he asked for us to clear the area. We continued clearing the area. One or two of them went over and they assisted the, the gunshot victim, and the rest of us were clearing out the area. I even took a minute or two to help them find the showcases. A few moments later, one of the officers said, the captain's coming on here, or the sergeant, I can't remember what he said. He said, whoever's left here, when the yellow tape goes up, he's going to be scared. So me and him, actually, this, and it, since there's so many cameras, you'll probably even see me and the officer go in the building and get people out of the building. I followed every guideline that they gave me to do that night. One or two of those officers walked in the building with me and told me that we need to get everybody out of the building. So when the altercation happened, or the verbal match happened with Blue and the other captains that were there, everybody was pretty much gone at that time. There was only a few workers there. There wasn't any group for anyone to get any witness statements or anything of that nature. It was only the few handful of people there left, and he had the problem with them because he wanted to go home. 
So it wasn't like anybody was stopping anybody from doing their job. There was no one left when they came to do that. So you're saying the original responding officers told you to get everybody out of there without taking anybody's names? That is correct. Like I said, that's if not you how look at the business. camera view. That's not how person, we do business, though. Because when you look at the camera, it's not about how you do business or what happens. Like I oh. stated, I'm the one that approached the officers, told them exactly who I was, and took the first few minutes to help find the shell casing. If you look at the video, I'm not a hard person to see in the video. You will see me show them exactly what happened. What You'll was the crowd like when those? What was the crowd like when those first two officers arrived? Was it a heavy crowd, or was it was it already thinned out? Well, mo most, most of, mostly everybody was kind of already feathered out and gone. Like I stated, there was mostly a, a handful of people that were still there. A couple of them were trying to take videos, and we moved them away from the area so that EMTs may wife could come in and assist the, the, the gunshot victim. Mostly so everybody got, was gone. You hmm? got rid of all our witnesses before we got there? Like I stated, when we kicked everybody out of the club after the first altercation, what happened is, is everybody was feathering out. It wasn't like we were out there kicking all these witnesses out. People were still running. People were leaving. The few that stayed there were the ones trying to take the videos. And there was only that one person that was still on the ground. The officers were pulling up. No one stopped anybody from leaving out the walkway. The officers walked through the group and came into, into the, the gate. I announced myself and helped them do whatever they asked me to do. All right. Well, I'll talk to the officers on scene to find out who told everybody to get out of there because that, that shouldn't have happened. Well, like said, we we was, might have to work on that on our spot, but uh, I'm having so, a hard time. And, and like I stated, I'll, I'll cooperate in any way that you would like me to, but if you look on the video, you will see that I escorted those officers in and they told me exactly what to do and me and my team did that. All right. The video speaks for itself like we just stated. Have you watched the video? I don't need to watch the video. The only thing I'm stating is if I was there, that means I'm in the video and you'll clearly see me walk in with those officers and I did exactly what they told me to do. I know, but is your recollection like five minutes before the shooting was the uh, fighting on the floor? Say that again. I'm sorry. You said five minutes before the shooting was the fight on the floor in the club? Yeah, anywhere, from, anywhere between five and ten minutes is when that happened. And we started to get people out of meetings. How, how big was the off. crowd that night? How big was the crowd that night? It was, it, was a, it was about almost 200 people, I would say. So how many people had gone off the premises and out of the area before the police arrived? Was it more than half would, the crowd? Or? I would probably say, yeah, more than half the crowd. Like I stated, so every, no everybody one, most, people, most, people, most people weren't standing around after a gunshot. Everybody Most wrapped up their tabs. Left. Everybody wrapped up their tabs in ten minutes and got out of there. That's that's what I'm saying to you. I don't know the accuracy of that, but there were still people in the building dealing with what they were dealing with. That's why me and the officer went in the building, and he told me to get everyone that that that, that doesn't need to be here out of the building. There were still people in there, but the, the the majority of the crowd was gone, and the officers were pulling up. No one stopped. Nobody put out any tape. No one stopped anybody from walking the walkway. They walked right past them and came into the yard. Okay, we're going to have to look at the video and see I what did, the fight was. The first, I did, first, the first thing I did was announce myself to the first officer that I ran into. And I helped them look for the shell cases. They asked me, Do, can, I, can I identify what the gun looked like? I told them, no, I wasn't out here for the shot. I don't know if it's a revolver. I don't know if it was a semi-automatic. They asked me how much shots. I said, I heard did you one tell shot. Anybody, could you tell any of those officers that the gentleman was shot in the shoulder before, because uh, I wasn't aware of that that night. No, I wasn't. I, no one was aware that. No one was aware that two people got shot until later on. Well, you said one gentleman was shot in the, the shoulder. Victim, one, the, you said it went through his shoulder and hit the other guy in the face. I told How do you. you know I that? told you what was. I told you. What do you was know, we don't it's even been, know that. It's been two months. But how do you know? You don't think people. So who's talking? Sir? Who's, you must have been like talking said, to some people. Maybe you should come in and talk to us and if you got some more that's information. That's not a problem. All that's right. That's not a problem. We'll schedule something, okay? You guys have my address. You guys have my mm -hmm. full name. You guys so have my, my, my phone Detective number. Detective McCarthy will contact you, okay? Not a problem. I've always been able to help. We don't need to be wasting the board's time right now, okay? 
Oh, no, Thank I understand you. that. But no one's reached out to me, so it's not that we're not trying to help. No one's reached out to me. I don't think I got that's one true. phone call. I, I got one phone call while I was in Texas. I got nothing else. Right. Detective McCarthy's pretty thorough. I don't, the, I don't the, think the that's video, true. The video, the video will, show you, will show you me helping. It seems like everybody wants to go through Attorney Blessa. Have you provided Blessa with those names? What names? Your employees. If I was asked, I'd give it. Have you talked to him about those employees? No, I don't have those. I can get those for you. Thank you. That's not a problem. Thanks, Jesse. Problem. Sorry, we don't want to waste the board's time anymore today. Thank you. Though. Yep. Uh, sure. And I, I just want to, um, Mr. Matov, does the board have your cell phone number for a 24 hour contact? Uh, if not, please take it now. Um, Danny, and I just want to reiterate why we require a 24 hour contact for the manager of record is for a situation like this. For three weeks, you shut down after this incident. We were not able to get in touch with you. If we had a 24 hour contact, we could have helped Boston Police with the investigation. So if you could make sure if you could give it that to us right now, we only use this in emergency situations to ask licensees to preserve video and in cases of emergency on the premise. I believe, yeah, and I'll give you the phone. Uh, uh, I believe you do have my phone number, uh, but uh, just in case, 617-828-8388. Okay, and that should be the number that you submit to the license licensing for when you renew your application, but I don't think everyone realizes we want a 24 hour contact. So we can actually contact you at any time or at any hour to ask for your cooperation. Yep. Uh, I have been contacted before, so that uh, gives me, uh, okay. that, that's I'm thinking, that, but uh, I just give it to you again. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any further questions at this time from the board on this matter? No. Oh, really. Thank you. Attorney Bletzer, if there's anything supplemental, please make sure that it is submitted to the board before the vote on Thursday morning. Yeah, we'll I'll send a 911 call in for you. I just want one more question. I just asked my staff to double check. They said the 24 hour contact we had is for someone named Olga. Who's Olga? Uh, one of our associates. She's What's currently. Her role? Uh, she is a uh, human resource. Okay, so we're going to update it to you, Mr. Matov, since the license is in your name and you ultimately are responsible for what was on the license premise. Okay. Yep. Thank you. And the record will stay open until Thursday. Please do submit anything supplemental that you may have. The board will take this matter under advisement. And thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Wasn't there a second call? We will now take a second call for item number one on the agenda. Uh, now calling 955 LLC doing business as Dillon's located at 951 Boylston Street. Date of the incident, October 31st, 2021. Patron on patron assault in violation of Mass General Laws, Chapter 138, Section 64, Chapter 265, Section 13A, and expired assembly permit in violation of Mass General Laws, Chapter 138, Section 64, and Boards Rule 1.02B. Who is present on behalf of the licensee? William Burke uh, is attorney for the licensee, and uh, Paul Wilson as the operations manager. Thank you. And who is present on behalf of the Boston Police Department? Detective Wallace. Detective Wallace. And Sergeant okay. Michael. Please. Great. And, uh, and Officer you... Richard Santiago. Sir. Great. Are there any other individuals who wish to testify with personal knowledge of the incident? No, thank you. And if possible, could everyone who is going to testify please put on their camera? Sorry, I'm on a cell phone. I don't have a camera in front of me. That's Paul Wilson. He doesn't, he, he's, he's remote and on the phone. Got it. Okay, could those who are going to testify please raise your right hand? Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Do. I do. Great, right, thank you. Uh, and could you please proceed with the police report? Okay, Detective Wallace, I can read that. Thank you. About 12.30 a.m. on Sunday, October 31st, 2021, Officer Santiago and Butcher will assign to the Delta 105 Alpha, respond, responded to a radio call for a fight at Dillon's. 
bar and restaurant, 955 Boylston Street in Boston. Upon arrival, Officer Marshall, Delta 499 Alpha was on scene speaking to victims. Victim number one later identified as Zachary Jordan stated he was involved in a verbal dispute in the bar, which led to a fight outside. Victim number one, Jordan stated that the unknown suspect hit him two times to the left side of the face with his palm. Officers observed no visible injuries. Victim number one declined Boston EMS. Victim number one stated that the suspect identified himself as a bouncer for the bar and an off-duty police officer. Victim number two later identified as Sophia Tipicito, stated that she was trying to figure out why the unknown suspect was fighting with her boyfriend, Jordan, when the suspect shoving her, causing her to hit her head on the light pole. Officers observed no visible injuries. Victim number two declined Boston EMS. Victim number three later identified as Ernie Venny, stated that the suspect shoved her. Victim number three stated that he did not fall down. She did not fall down and was not injured. Victim number four later identified as James Griffin, stated he consumed a lot of alcohol and does not remember what happened. All parties refused medical attention. Officer Marshall spoke to the manager, later identified as Gio Vega, who stated that victim number one, Jordan, had a verbal dispute with his bartender when another patron suspect got involved and both parties went outside to fight. The manager, uh, Vega, stated that suspect was not a bouncer with the bar and does not know who he is. It should be noted that this fight took place outside of the aforementioned address, where there were security cameras that may have captured the incident. Suspect is described as a very tall, well-dressed black male. Officers canvassed the area for the suspect with negative results. Sergeant Aziz, the Delta 910, responded to the scene. Sergeant Aziz issued a license premise inspection notice 044625 to the manager of Vega for patron on patron assault, expired assembly permit dated 09-30-2021. Thank you. Uh, Attorney Burke, would you like to address the alleged incident? Uh, yes, I would, please. Uh, uh, first of all, let me state that Mr. Vega is, for reasons beyond my control, not available to us this morning, but I'm prepared to uh, put together a statement from him uh, and submit it to the uh, board before uh, before Thursday for you. Um, Mr. Mr. Um, Wilson, who's the operations manager, is here and did conduct an investigation. So let me, if I may, direct uh, some questions to him. Mr. Wilson, uh, in the course of you conducting the investigation uh, into this matter, following it, did you have an opportunity to look for video um, uh, footage of the incident outside? Video outside the premises, there was no, um, for where the incident happened, it was not within the scope of the video from our premises. So you don't have any footage that captures what occurred outside with these individuals, is that fair to say? Yes, it is. Okay, and with respect to the rest of your investigation, did you find out why this group of individuals had come into the bar initially? Uh, we discovered that they had been partaking in a bar crawl for Halloween around the Back Bay area and had ended up in Dillon's. We were not part of the said bar crawl and they were looking for discounted drinks that they had received at other establishments and that were participating in the bar crawl. We let them know that we were not part of it. There were no discounted drinks available. And they started uh, giving the bartender a hard time about it. Um, a patron who was at the bar had asked them to lay it off and don't be abusing the bartender. At that point, they seemed to go outside. There was a slight scuffle. Um, and before we knew it, the police were outside. Okay. Um, and with respect to uh, after the police arrived, did your people... Uh, fully cooperate with them and uh, and uh, give the usual cooperation that's required uh, uh, of the Boston Police Department? I believe so, yes, it did. Okay, and it's true that Mr. Vega told them that he did not know who this individual was. And in fact, um, were you able to determine that the individual who was involved was described only as a very tall, well-dressed black male? Uh, are you able to tell us whether or not he's on your staff, either at, at Dillon or anywhere else? He's not on our staff at all. And, and is it fair to say that nobody knows who this individual is? That is correct. Okay. I don't have any further questions. Uh, I'll leave it to the board. Uh, oh, let me just address, if I may, I'm sorry. The expired assembly permit, Mr. Wilson, uh, had you in fact uh, made reapplication and made the payments necessary, but not yet received the new permit? At, at that time, we had made payment for it. 
um, we had neglected to post a copy of the um, cash check from the um, license or from the um, inspectional services to post it, but that was submitted with our license application, um, and we did receive our new license this year. Okay, I'll leave it to the board, Madam Chair, for any questions. I don't have any questions at this time. Thank you. None for me, thank you. I don't either, thank you. Thank you, I'll submit that uh, statement from Mr. Vega uh, directly to the board. Thank you, yeah, please do so thank before you. the board votes on Thursday morning. I shall, thank you, Mr. Green. Thank you, uh, and the board will take this matter under advisement. Thank you. Those are, those are all the items before the board today, so thank you everybody. Thank you.